In 1807, Jörg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel published his work The Phenomenology of Spirit, which he described as an exposition of the coming to be of knowledge. Later, a young law student named Karl Marx would fall into the rough and tumble crowd of the young Hegelian movement and abandon the path of law for radical Hegelian philosophy. His path would intersect with one Frederick Engels, and the two would begin a collaboration that would be immortalized in the very plausibly homoerotic 2019 Chinese animated series The Leader. In 1844, Marx wrote what would be published as the Economic and Philosophical Manuscripts of 1844. And then a whole bunch of stuff happened, and if you need a summary or just a quick refresher, go ahead and pause the video. Go up to that search bar and type in, we didn't start the fire. I'll still be here when you get back. Over 150 years later, in 2002, Welcome to the NHK, a fictionalized semi-autobiographical novel written by Tatsuhiko Takimoto would hit shelves in Japan. The events of the novel follow Tatsuhiro Sato, a 22-year-old social recluse who has spent most of the last four years isolated in his apartment and has come to believe that his seclusion is actually the result of a powerful conspiracy against him. All of these works are in conversation with one another, but you might have noticed that one of them is not like the others. Marx and Hegel are both big-name philosophers, and you can take an entire college class on just one of their major works. Meanwhile, my copy of the 2007 Tokyo Pop English localization of Welcome to the NHK clocks in at a comparatively lean 237 pages. It's the kind of easy reading that you can comfortably knock out in a couple of hours on a rainy afternoon, speaking from experience. But despite the small package, Welcome to the NHK still grapples with many of the same themes and questions that you'll find in Marx and Hegel's writing. Things like issues of creativity, loneliness, and the very human struggles that go along with being a person. Moreover, its use of modern times as a setting make it a contemporary piece. At the time of publication, Welcome to the NHK was directly in conversation with the social trends happening in Japan at the time. In the 20 years since, and through its reimagining as both a manga and anime, it has only become more relevant to the plights of modern life. Before getting into the work though, let's go over some history as well as a little bit of philosophy to understand the historical moment that produced Welcome to the NHK, how things have changed since then, as well as the specific framing that I'm going to be taking here. First off, let's talk about alienation. In no small part due to Marx and Hegel, the idea of alienation has become one of the most important concepts in the philosophical and sociological understanding of modernity. However, pinning it down to a single definition can be surprisingly difficult. The broad concept of alienation dates back to the 15th century, and it has worn a lot of hats between then and now. Alienation has been a way for referring to everything from the transfer of property rights all the way up to humanity's separation from God. Odds are also pretty good that you probably have your own working definition of alienation that you're also bringing to the table here. So, broadly speaking, when Marx and Hegel are talking about alienation, they're referring to a separation between a subject and an object that otherwise belong together. For Hegel, alienation occurs via two processes, estrangement, or Entfremdung, and externalization, or Entersurung. We, as people, have a conscious mind that is aware of itself as separate from the surrounding world. Because of that separation, we don't feel at home in the world around us. So we externalize ourselves via interacting with and investing in the world around us. In doing so, we leave pieces of ourselves in a process that Hegel calls objectification. We take these pieces of ourselves and transform them into objects that we can recognize as separate from ourselves but in doing so also start to wear down that barrier between ourselves and the world. Gradually, this transforms the world and our relationship with it, and ultimately that reflects back to us and helps us develop ourselves. So for Hegel, alienation can actually be a positive force and is actually necessary for the development of culture. It is, after all, just the starting point of a broader process and a universal part of being a person. 
If you rolled your eyes at that description, either because you clicked on a video about Welcome to the NHK and you don't see how any of this is related, or because Hegel is just that opaque and none of this seems practical, well, I've got good news for you. Because Marx did too. Well, maybe not that part about Welcome to the NHK, but you know what I mean. For Marx, this framing of alienation is overly intellectual and lacks any basis in material reality. He also objected to the idea that alienation is a necessary part of being a person. From a Marxist perspective, alienation is bad, actually. Like Hegel, Marx also thinks that it is through work that we develop as people. And also like Hegel, Marx theorized that when we make something, we are investing ourselves into it via our time, expertise, etc. In return, we grow our skills, develop our understanding of the world, and continue to better ourselves. At least, that should be the case. At present, not all work is good work. Because something has gone wrong in the connection between work and our own development. Our current alienated way of being is a result of the times that we live in. Capitalism. Marx specifically focuses on ownership of the means of production and wage labor as the leading causes of alienation in modernity. So let's put all this in concrete terms. Let's say that you have skills in woodworking. However, industrial tools in the wood itself is more than you can afford. But you happen to know a guy who has all of those, but doesn't have the time or skill to do the work themselves. So you step in and agree to do the work in exchange for a wage. You make things out of that wood and then the owner takes what you make and sells it for more than the value of the wood itself. The extra value coming from the labor that you also put into the object. You're then paid a portion of that extra value and that's what we call a wage. You, as a worker, are still investing yourself into your work. However, you don't have any say in what happens to the product of your work. It is separate and alienated from you. Marx further breaks down alienation into four different vectors. The first of these is alienation from the object, which we've already mostly covered. In wage labor, you give of yourself and you don't receive in return. Quoting from the Economic and Philosophical Manuscripts of 1844, quote, the worker becomes an ever cheaper commodity the more commodities he creates. Labor produces not only commodities, it produces itself and the worker as a commodity, and this at the same rate at which it produces commodities in general. The second form of alienation is alienation from the process of labor. Working for a wage, you aren't free to develop your quote-unquote physical and mental energy. If you're lucky enough to have only one job, you can spend up to 40 hours of your week working somewhere where you are told what to do, when you can clock out, and when you can even go to the bathroom. Never mind the time that you might spend commuting to and from work and not getting paid. You know how the old saying goes, boss makes a dollar, you make a dime, remember to like, comment, and subscribe on company time. Even the people who are lucky enough to have found dream jobs find themselves burning out because work itself is exhausting even if you kinda like what it is that you're doing. For those of us that don't love our jobs and are just working to get a paycheck, there is little incentive to improve beyond doing the minimum needed to get paid, as a job is just a job after all. Quoting again from the Economic and Philosophical Manuscripts of 1844, quote, the worker therefore only feels himself outside his work and in his work feels outside himself. He feels at home when he is not working and when he is working he does not feel at home." End quote. This idea is developed even further in the third form of alienation. Alienation from what Marx calls our species being. Marx actually has a fairly romantic view of people, where we are all inherently creative. Left to our own devices, we make things, art, and culture. We better ourselves and each other because that's just what we do. Just think about all the times when you were a kid where you made up stories playing pretend or you drew pictures, not because it was profitable, but because it was just fun to do. It's something that I like to think about whenever I hear the argument that without money, nobody would want to do anything. 
Marx would say that we would still work, we would just have more control over the kinds of work that we're doing. And if you don't want to take Marx's word on it, just take it from Jean-Luc Picard. The acquisition of wealth is no longer the driving force in our lives. We work to better ourselves and the rest of humanity. And if you don't want to take Jean-Luc's word on it, take it from James Kirk in Star Trek IV, The One with the Whales. You have that to go, please. Sure. Who gets the bad news? Don't tell me they don't use money in the 23rd century. Well, we don't. God, I just, I really love that movie. <laughs> this penchant for creative expression is what Marx calls our Gattungswesen, or human nature. Creative work is seen in Marx's early writings as the highest form of work in terms of self-development. So our work should be connecting us with our human nature, but wage labor inverts this relationship. Work becomes just a means to an end. Fulfillment takes a back seat to making sure that you can afford rent and food for the next month. After all, the cost of living really means the cost to stay alive. Marx even goes so far as to say that, quote, what is animal becomes human, and what is human becomes animal, end quote. Fourth and finally, people are alienated from each other. To the person who owns the means of production, the value of the worker is limited to their ability to work. Further, it is in their best interest to pay those workers as little as possible. The worker, however, wants to be paid as much as possible. Meanwhile, the workers themselves are in competition with one another. If I'm working for a wage and someone comes up and says that they're willing to do the same work for less, then the value of my labor has gone down. In this system, every person is an island left to fend for their own interests while interacting with other people primarily as commodities at best and enemies at worst. Marx theorized that alienation would eventually reach a critical mass and trigger the end of capitalism as it transitioned into something new. Which, spoiler alert, as you probably know, hasn't happened yet. But that doesn't mean that change isn't coming. And perhaps it would be better if we looked for it not in the form of a bang, but rather a whimper. Let's take the example of Japan's lost decade of the 1990s. Those who were unfortunate enough to graduate at this time found themselves facing an employment ice age. While 1.7 million job offers were made to high school graduates in 1992, that number had declined to just 200,000 by 2003. Some graduates who were unable to find stable full-time employment became freeders, or freelancers who make a living via temporary or freelance work. Others withdrew from the labor market entirely and became NEETs, not in education, employment, or training. Of those NEETs, some also withdrew from social life, becoming hikikomori. Hikikomori is a term derived from the verbs hiki, meaning to withdraw, and komori, meaning to be inside. The Ministry of Health and Labor and Welfare defines hikikomori as someone who is neither in work, school, and has remained in social withdrawal for more than six months. The actual prevalence of hikikomori is understandably hard to gauge, with some estimates reaching in excess of a million, and other more conservative estimates landing somewhere in the hundreds of thousands. As with most things recorded in the haunted tome known as macroeconomics, the causes of the lost decade are numerous and complicated. However, we can trace some of those causes back to 1981. It's Reagan again. The election of Ronald Reagan signaled a sea change in monetary policy. During his campaign and extending into his presidency, Reagan pushed for a return to the principles of free enterprise that had been in place before the Great Depression. Basically, many of the policies that FDR had put in place to save capitalism from itself were either eliminated or scaled back. Taxes on the wealthy were reduced, regulations on industry were rolled back, and government spending on social programs was cut. It's really amazing just how many graphs you can look at mark 1981 and see how things have gotten worse from there. Whether it's the relationship between productivity and wages, CEO pay relative to the average worker, life expectancy versus healthcare spending, the number of incarcerated Americans, the cost of college tuition, the ratio of debt to income, 
even empirically measured vibes. It all just keeps getting worse. Credit to Twitter user WardQ for pulling many of these together. In the early 1980s, the United States and Japan established the inventively named United States and Japan Committee for the Yen and US Dollar. The United States used this committee to push for Japan to adopt some of the deregulations that were happening at home, like making riskier loans and opening up the yen to international trading. Meanwhile, the United States and other countries also pushed for the passage of the Plaza Accord, which depreciated the US dollar relative to the yen, franc, deutsche mark, and British pound via intervention, making US exports more competitive in those markets. These two factors helped create an asset bubble in the Japanese economy from the mid-1980s all the way to 1991 when the bubble burst and Japan's economy entered the lost decade. The economic changes of the lost decade didn't create the hikikomori phenomenon. There are documented cases of social withdrawal dating back to the 1970s and even into the bubble years of the 1980s. However, the changing social landscape and rising rates of social withdrawal sparked after the bubble burst led to a national and subsequently global conversation about hikikomori. For example, two Japanese newspapers, Asahi Shinun and Yomiyori Shinbun, only mentioned hikikomori four times in 1985, but those same papers mentioned hikikomori nearly 800 times in 2005. Interest was further propelled by the publication of Japanese psychiatrist Saito Tamaki's book, Hikikomori Adolescence Without End. While initially thought of as a culturally specific phenomenon, hikikomori cases have been identified outside of Japan as well. Roughly half of hikikomori cases are comorbid or co-occurring with other diagnoses like obsessive compulsive disorder, depression, or schizoaffective symptoms. But the remaining half don't fit into an existing diagnostic category, suggesting that the root of withdrawal is a complex set of interactions between the person and the world around them. Even now as I'm recording this in 2024, whether hikikomori should be a separate diagnostic category altogether remains an open topic in the literature. It was as the cultural conversation around hikikomori picked up in the 1990s that Tatsuhiko Takimoto, himself living as a hikikomori, had a thought. Quote, As a sharp-eyed man, I thought I'd jump on the tide of the times and earn a ton of money. I'll write a story about hikikomori and become famous. I'll become a best-selling author with my hikikomori story. I'll go to Hawaii using the royalties. I'll go to Waikiki. End quote. And so began the process that would give the world welcome to the NHK. But the act of writing a novel about a hikikomori while living as a hikikomori himself proved to be a more difficult process than expected. It's in the first afterword to Welcome to the NHK where Takimoto laments this realization. Quote, What happens when a real hikikomori writes a hikikomori story? Inevitably, you start having to use your own experiences in your creation. You start having to write about yourself. Of course, stories are fiction. No matter how much one of the characters I use looks like me, he is himself, and I am myself. Regardless, it was still painful. It was embarrassing. I felt as though I were taking my own shame and revealing it to the whole world." End quote. And it's not just Takimoto who found something to connect with in this story. Loneliness, paranoia, conspiracism, and yes, alienation are all things that many people grapple with in the modern age. Even 20 years after the publication of the original novel, Welcome to the NHK has remained in conversations both in casual circles as well as academic discussions of hikikomori. In fact, the translation note of the 2013 English edition of the previously mentioned Hikikomori Adolescence Without End that I read for this video specifically nods to Welcome to the NHK and mentions its place in this cultural conversation. So what actually is Welcome to the NHK? The original light novel was published in 2002 in Japan and in English in 2007. The success of the novel inspired a manga adaption, also written by Takimoto and illustrated by Kendi Oiwa, which ran from December 2003 to May 2007. As the manga departs heavily from the plot of the novel while also adding new characters and rewriting existing ones, it wouldn't be unfair to consider it an entirely different story. 
In a 2021 interview as part of Anime Lockdown, Takimoto mentioned that the 2007 anime adaption by Studio Gonzo is his favorite version of the story. It's also the version that he had no involvement in. Director Yusuke Yamamoto and writer Satoru Nishizono, as well as the rest of the staff, took the elements from the manga that worked, pruned what didn't, and then blended it together with the framework of the novel while keeping things tonally consistent. So to talk about Welcome to the NHK as a property, it's best to talk about the whole thing. So this is a spoiler warning for all three iterations of Welcome to the NHK as I'm going to go into these three stories, how they complement each other, where they diverge, as well as how they all connect back to these themes of alienation. As always, these are my takes. Takes so hot that they make the sun look cold. If you disagree or you see things differently, let me know in a comment. Hearing other people's perspectives about things that I care about is honestly my favorite part of doing this. Regardless of the version of the story that you're going with, Welcome to the NHK revolves around Tatsuhiro Sato, a university dropout who has spent the last four years only leaving his apartment for essentials. He finances his lifestyle via an allowance he receives from his parents, who he has been lying to and think that he's on the cusp of finishing college. It's in his dirty six-mat apartment that Sato comes to a realization when he overhears a television program thanking subscribers to the NHK, the Nippon Hoso Kyokai, or Japanese Broadcasting Corporation. Or at least, it would seem. Sato sees through the veil and decodes that the acronym actually stands for the Nihon Hikikomori Kyokai, or the Japanese Hikikomori Plan. A sinister conspiracy that plans to turn people into hikikomori to give the rest of society someone that they can look down on. The monotonous haze hanging over Sato's daily life starts to clear when he meets Misaki Nakahara, the niece of a religious solicitor that happened to stop by his apartment with her aunt one day. After several egregious social fumbles, she offers Sato a place in her program, an experimental system that can cure him of his hikikomori ways. Initially reluctant to enter, Sato claims that she's mistaken. He's actually very employed. He's super employed even. He's a game creator and he just happens to work from home. Having also learned that his old high school junior and current game design vocational school student, Kaoru Yamazaki, now lives in the apartment next door, Sato goes to him for help to find some way of covering for his lie. This sets in motion a series of events that would lead the two on a grand quest to make the greatest hentai game ever made. From there, the three continuities start to diverge. In all three versions, Sato also reconnects with his old high school senior, Hitomi Kashiwa. In the novel, she's a minor character appearing predominantly in flashbacks and one chapter of the book, but her involvement is greatly expanded on in the manga and anime. Also exclusive to the manga and anime, Sato reconnects with another former classmate, Megumi Kobayashi, who is being crushed by a pyramid scheme and trying to pull Sato in to boost herself up. From here, the plot of Welcome to the NHK unfolds not unlike the parable of the blind men and the elephant. You've probably heard some variation of the story, but just in case. Five blind men hear that an elephant has been brought to town, but they don't know what one looks like. So using their senses of touch, the five of them each touch a different part of the animal and come away with a very different image. Like imagining a spear having touched the animal's tusk, or touching a leg and assuming that an elephant is actually a kind of tree. Each of the characters across the different continuities of Welcome to the NHK are dealing with different challenges, but they are all dealing with extensions of the kinds of alienation synonymous with modern life. This connection between modernity, alienation, and welcome to the NHK clicked with me during a recent reread of the novel. In it, I noticed that almost every character says some variation of the phrase, the problem with this world is that it doesn't have any enemies. And in this world without enemies, it might become necessary to create them. Conspiracism is one of the major through lines in welcome to the NHK. The preface to the novel even opens with the line, quote, In this world, conspiracies exist. However, there is a more than 99% chance that the plausible sounding conspiracies that you hear about from others are simple delusions or even intentional lies. End quote. The preface then goes on to lay out the perspective of the novel. People create conspiracies for a reason. 
typically as a way of either explaining the disorder of the world or to deflect away from their own failings. One piece of information unique to the novel, due to its use of the first-person perspective, is that Sato himself doesn't actually believe in the NHK. Rather, he understands that he needs to believe that he's the victim of a conspiracy, or at least pretend that he does. So long as he can believe that the NHK Broadcasting Company has been keeping him trapped in his hikikomori ways, he doesn't have to feel ashamed of himself. After all, what could one person hope to do against such a broad and powerful conspiracy? There is actually a large cross-disciplinary literature focusing on why people adopt different conspiracy theories. There are a number of reasons, one of which is to maintain their self-esteem. What Sato is doing here by externalizing his faults to a conspiracy is one way of doing exactly that. However, it's his former high school senior, Hitomi, that best embodies the connection between alienation and conspiracy theory via her use of one of the other functions of conspiracy theories, their ability to make sense of the world. To an outside observer, and even in her own admission, Hitomi has a good life. Depending on the continuity, she's either unemployed or working as a bureaucrat. She also has a marriage to a handsome and wealthy man on the horizon. Once they're married, she'll slide comfortably into the life of a housewife and never have another worry for the rest of her days. At least that's the way that it feels like it should be. In reality, she's being crushed by despair. In the continuities where she is working, she's working a bullshit job. She's heavily self-medicating using prescriptions from three different psychiatrists and unable to reconcile the friction between how she does feel and the joy that she thinks she should be feeling. She also has the distinction of being the only other character in the series to see the conspiracy goblins. She sees them in the anime after taking a pill following getting lectured at work. In the novel, the connection between drugs and these hallucinations is more overt as Sato only sees them during his experiments with psychedelics, but this was removed in the anime. As Hitomi's character unfolds via flashbacks, we learn that Hitomi was also likely the source of Sato's own use of conspiracy theories. In the literature club room after school, the two of them would spend hours playing cards and chatting about whatever was on her mind that day. In his memories, it's clear that Hitomi is deeply depressed, although younger Sato can't understand why a pretty girl would have any reason to be sad. Nearing graduation and having failed to get into the university that she aimed for, Hitomi is also the first character to say her version of that line. Our problem is that there are no villains anywhere. Bad things happen to good people. In fact, she doesn't even think that there's such a thing as a bad person. And yet, everything seems to be getting worse. The only explanation is that there's a conspiracy. It's not a surprise that conspiracy theories tend to pop up around major events, whether it's the JFK assassination, Jimmy Hoffa's disappearance, or the Manson murders. Conspiracy theories have a powerful ability to help people make sense of the world. They organize the noise of modern life into a simple story, usually featuring clear-cut good guys and bad guys. Studies on the subject have shown that conspiracy beliefs are associated with feelings of powerlessness and anxiety. In laboratory experiments, psychologists have shown that people who feel a stronger perception of control in a situation also show a reduction in conspiratorial leanings. In our modern lives, we are all at the whim of incomprehensibly vast and complicated forces. Sometimes I actually get this feeling in the back of my mind, and maybe you get it too. I look at how things are, and I can't help but think that no one designing a society would have built this one. And yet, here we are. Believing that all the things wrong with the world are the fault of an evil organization is one way of pushing back against alienation and placing things back into concrete terms. In the novel, Sato also suggests that both he and Hitomi experience recurring bouts of depression. There's a certain horror that goes along with knowing that your brain just doesn't quite work the way that it feels like it should. And even if you get angry about it, there's no one to direct that anger at. It's nobody's fault. As Hitomi and Sato part ways after their reunion in the novel, he thinks to himself about how someone like her should have a chance to live a happy life, and how for someone in her position, being able to blame a huge evil organization is a form of wish fulfillment. 
While it's never mentioned in any of the continuities, I personally like to think that Hitomi shares Sato's self-awareness. She knows that there is no actual conspiracy, but she believes that she believes it out of necessity. When I first went through Welcome to the NHK in all of its various forms, I found myself relating mostly to Sato, as I expect many did. This time around though, Hitomi is the character that I found myself relating to the most. She's someone who is checking all the boxes of what it's supposed to mean to be successful, but struggling to find joy in it. Turns out, being an adult is hard, just maybe not in the ways that you were expecting. Well, maybe this is a new form of the Shinji to Misato Evangelion trans pipeline, and really, we just need to shut this whole thing down until we can figure out what's going on here. So, inventing and projecting onto an enemy is one way of dealing with alienation, both in Welcome to the NHK as well as in real life, but it's not the only way. There is also an extensive psychological literature on social comparison and why people do it. Downward social comparison in particular, or looking over and thinking to yourself, well, at least I'm not that guy, is one technique that a person might use to boost their sense of challenge self-worth. In the story, this is best shown by Megumi Kobayashi. In flashbacks, she is a uptight class rep with a bright future ahead of her. But sometime after graduation, her father passed away, leaving her to support herself as well as her brother. She dropped out of college and started working in maid cafes and cosplay boutiques. It's work that she found humiliating, but without a college degree, she wasn't left with many options. Even though Megumi was excellent at these jobs, the owners of the shops would close up and run off, leaving her with nothing to show for her effort. From the Marxist lens, Megumi is a textbook case of alienation. Without a safety net to fall back on, she had to produce herself as a commodity to be consumed by others. But even when she succeeded, she was left with nothing because she never had any ownership over her labor. She became all the poorer, the more wealth she produced. And when she's at her lowest, she's recruited into a pyramid scheme and quickly finds herself drowning in debt. Drowning as though she may be, she takes to the business like a fish to water. When Sato realizes that she's trying to recruit him into the scheme and confronts her about it, Megumi lays it all out in plain language. As someone who has been exploited, her world has been split into winners and losers, and she has decided to switch teams. By weaponizing her sales skills and the exploitative structure of the business against other people, she can finally be a winner. She can go from being the exploited to the exploiter, literally turning her relationships into money. Her delivery of all of this comes off as slightly more sympathetic in the anime adaption than the manga, but the sentiment is all still there. Megumi also isn't the only character coping with the pitfalls of modern life by situating herself in a hierarchy. Misaki enters the story with seemingly benevolent intentions. You'd even be fair to say that she's initially a manic pixie dream girl. On the surface, she seems to only exist in the story to help Sato. I mean, he even pictures her in his mind palace as an actual angel. However, she has a fair bit in common with Megumi. In all three continuities, Misaki meets Sato seemingly by chance and offers him a position in her program. What does that program actually entail? Mostly her sitting down and reading self-help books and psychoanalysis textbooks that she herself very clearly doesn't understand. Even early in the process, Sato acknowledges that as much as she seems to know a lot about him, he doesn't know anything about her, which is exactly what she wants. The truth is that Misaki and Sato's meeting was no accident. She lives in the house on the hill with her aunt and uncle. From that house, she has a clear view into Sato's apartment, hence why she knows so much about him and that he's been living as a hikikomori. She's not a manic pixie dream girl. She's a stalker who has been manipulating Sato from the moment that they met. Misaki's background in the novel and animation helps to explain her behavior. Her father died around the time of her birth, and her mother remarried an abusive man who drank and beat her regularly. Eventually, her mother took her own life, leaving Misaki alone with her stepfather until she eventually came to Tokyo to live with her aunt and uncle. Misaki internalized her trauma as her own fault, coming to see herself as an unwanted person that only brings misfortune to the people around her. 
Her interest in Sato is genuine and stems from a plan to find someone even lower than herself. Surely a worthless Hikikomori, someone like him, wouldn't be able to reject her. And maybe he could even come to like her. Like Megumi, in a way Misaki is looking down on Sato. The animation even nods to this overlap in a scene where Masaki, Yamazaki, and Sato are visiting Megumi's house, and she sees Megumi's own psychoanalytic textbooks which she had been using to try to cure her own Hikikomori brother. Whereas Megumi is fully aware of what she's doing and even seems to take pleasure in looking down on people, Masaki's actions are instead driven by her own intense sense of loneliness and trauma. This reveal of her backstory and the resolution of her character arc is at the emotional heart of Welcome to the NHK. However, she is almost entirely different in the manga. While she does still reveal the same backstory of having been abused by her stepfather, she later drops that all of that was a lie. She made it all up to make Sato feel guilty enough that he would do anything for her. Toward the end of the manga, her school counselor tries to explain her behavior as a result of quote-unquote dramatic personality disorder. There's even an author's note in the margin that calls her a compulsive liar. If that isn't enough, she plays the game with Sato. You know, the brainwashing technique that Sinanon used on people in the 70s. That one. Upon revisiting the manga, it's the changes to Misaki's characterization that take me out of the story more than anything else. When I was a teenager reading this, I thought that the more cynical tone of the story was deep. In the way that the first time you watch Inception as a teenager, it seems like the smartest movie of all time. But then when you come back and watch it a couple of years later, you start to see where the ends are fraying. Since Marx and Hegel place an emphasis on the importance of creativity, I also want to mention the hentai game that Yamazaki and Sato make during the story. In the novel and the manga, the game is mostly forgotten as the story pivots to more character-focused drama. It's only in the animation that they actually finish it. The scene where Sato and Yamazaki are sitting in a dark apartment and watching the final cutscene of their game play out as their names scroll through the credits is one of my favorite moments in this series in any of its continuities. There's just an unqualified sense of joy and satisfaction there that you really don't see at other junctions in this story. Unfortunately, the game flops and they only end up selling about five copies. Looking back on it, even Sato admits that the game is amateurish because, well, so are they. But on their way back to their apartments, Yamazaki, who did most of the development for the game, confides that he doesn't really care that it didn't sell well. There was a value in making the game itself, and disappointing sales can't take that accomplishment away from them. In every version of the story, Yamazaki eventually moves back to Hokkaido at the request of his family, but it's only in the anime that he gets any form of resolution beyond resignation to his familial obligations. As he's leaving, he even asks Masaki to take care of Sato, contrasting heavily against his honestly cartoonish level of misogyny earlier in the story. Making the game and working together with Sato was transformative for both of them, in much the way that Marx describes in his writings on the value of creative work. They put pieces of themselves into that game, and in turn that was reflected back at them and helped them to develop as people. Welcome to the NHK is as much a story about the effects of alienation on people's lives as it is a story about how people find connection in a world seemingly determined to drive them apart. Even though each of the characters mentioned are dealing with their own demons, they each find some kind of resolution or have started on a path toward a brighter future. In each case, that is something that was only possible through the connections that they made with other people. Maybe people that are very different from themselves, and maybe even people that they have gone out of their way to hurt, but still other people who can look at them with all their flaws and believe that they too deserve a shot at happiness. The secret is solidarity, the ability to find connection with someone very different from yourself. This plays out best at the conclusion of Sato's arcs with Hitomi and Masaki respectively. Facing the looming prospects of motherhood and marriage, Hitomi impulsively asks Sato to have an affair with her. 
I read this as an attempt at self-sabotage. It's a way of burning down the life that she has ahead of her instead of taking the risk of trusting that it's not going to just fall apart anyway. Attracted to her as he may be, Sato rejects her offer and instead encourages her to take that risk and trust that the uncertain happiness ahead of her is something that can last. Later in the story, after passing Masaki's final exam and graduating from her project, she presents Sato with a new contract that will bind them together as a couple. But he rejects it, recognizing that her proposal is coming from a place of loneliness rather than affection. It's a moment of development for Sato, as his earlier self likely would have accepted the offer. His rejection pushes the story into the climax and ultimately the resolution of another contract between Sato and Masaki, this one coming from a place of mutual support. In the new contract, Masaki frames their situation as being similar to mutually assured destruction between the United States and the Soviet Union. As long as one of them is still willing to try living, the other one will as well. It's a little way of saying that I'm still in this as long as you're still in this even if it gets hard. Each version of the story has a different take on this concept of a revolution bomb. Depending on the version, it can either be an actual bomb, a figurative symbol of ineffective youth rebellion, or just a figment of Sato's overactive imagination. However, I'm going to propose that the real revolution bomb in Welcome to the NHK is in these interactions where the characters put themselves aside and take care of somebody else. After all, in a world that presses you to see other people as objects to be used and consumed, what could be more revolutionary than caring about another person more than yourself? Stepping back from the specifics of the story, Welcome to the NHK is set in and in conversation with a very specific moment in Japanese history but it has remained in the hearts and minds of fans all over the world even 20 years after its initial publication. Poking around review sites, it's not uncommon to find comparisons between Welcome to the NHK and Catcher in the Rye. I imagine that the two also share a similar appeal. Like Colton Caulfield and Catcher in the Rye, the characters in Welcome to the NHK are dealing with feelings that the reader can relate to. Loneliness is an epidemic, even though we are more connected to other people than ever. The advent of hustle culture promises that anything not only can become work, but that it should become work. Even in our social lives, via social media, we're asked to perform an always-on, curated version of ourselves for the consumption of others. Everyone around us is also carrying cameras, and some days it feels like an effort just not to show up in the background of somebody else's photo or video. It's almost like we've managed to build the Panopticon from Foucault's famous work. It would really, really suck to live in the Panopticon. If Marx was right about only feeling ourselves at home and outside of ourselves at work, then the time that we actually feel at home seems to be getting smaller and smaller. Maybe it shouldn't be a surprise that Tatsuhiko Takimoto has started publishing a series of short stories called Rebuild of Welcome to the NHK to reframe the story in current times. Having read a few of them for this video, it's disarming to see how easily these characters can slide into a modern setting, but even in a world with smartphones and line, alienation is just as real as ever. In some ways, Welcome to the NHK feels more relevant today than it did when it was first published because the problems discussed in it are still current problems for many of us. It's a message in a bottle from an earlier time that you are not alone in your loneliness, in your alienation, or in the feeling that much of your life is outside of your control. But despite all of that, you also aren't as terrible as you might think yourself to be. And no matter what faults you may have, there are still people that can value you. And even though it might be scary, there just might be a better world out there for you. As much as Welcome to the NHK has stayed with readers and viewers, it has also interestingly stayed with its author. There are two official afterwards published in 2001 and 2005 respectively where Takimoto laments his own relapse into being the hikikomori living off the royalties of his book and how he has struggled to write anything since. However, in 2016, a full 14 years after the initial publication of the novel, Takimoto published an entry on his since-deleted blog that fits in as a third afterward. 
In that entry, he reflects on his own sense of failure since writing the novel, having failed to properly resolve the issue of Sato's loneliness, and now also recognizing that the loneliness he was writing about in the story was a reflection of his own feelings. It's something that he didn't have the ability to write about at the time, and something that he still is not sure he does while writing the afterword in 2016. The concluding paragraph of the entry serves as both a belated conclusion to the novel as well as the most fitting conclusion I can think of for this video. Quoting from a translation that I found preserved on Reddit, quote, The most important thing is to know that you can change. Anyway, the path that leads to happiness exists. The key is, precisely, to trust in its existence. Even if a person is in a situation described as in Welcome to the NHK, there is a way out. A path leading to a happy ending. I want to tell you now, Sato, Masaki, Yamazaki, and Senpai as well, they all succeeded in finding happiness in a happy ending. For sure they have already found it, and with them a new world has already begun. What I wanted to describe is not the weakness of men. Even in the labyrinth of a confused heart, no matter how a person may feel weakness and loss of energy, in the end it's possible to find a way out and rediscover herself. This is what I wanted to write. This conviction that I had not expressed while working on Welcome to the NHK, I write it now. And with this, my novel is complete." End quote. And with this, this video is complete. Whew, okay. Thank you for sticking around to the end of the video. Welcome to the NHK is a very special piece of media for me, and it hit me at a very particular time in my life. Reading it was actually a big factor in getting myself out of a rut and starting on working on myself. Had I not read it when I did, I might not be making this video now, or really be making any videos at all for that matter. You know, when you're a teenager, you make these big overblown statements that are absolutely ridiculous in hindsight, but seem appropriate in the moment. And believe it or not, I was a teenager too once. And after I watched the anime, then read the manga, and then read the novel on its release, I slammed the book shut and I put it on my shelf, and I swore that this was the start of a new chapter in my life, and that I never wanted to come back and, and read this book ever again. And obviously that did not work out. In fact, I was actually really excited to revisit this book, and going through it again as an adult with just a, a few extra years under my belt and then getting into the historical context of it was a lot of fun for me and really added a lot to the book on the second reading, seeing both how like I've changed and how differently I related to it. I really wasn't expecting to find Ronald Reagan in there, but I guess I shouldn't be that surprised. If you look at a bad thing for long enough, he will eventually show up. It's kind of like saying Bloody Mary's name three times in a mirror in a dark room. Anyway. A lot of work went into this, and hopefully you enjoyed it. I think this is the most work I've done on a video so far. I probably did more work on this, at least in terms of research, than I did on my master's thesis. I also recorded and edited this while I was recovering from a concussion that I got at my first HEMA tournament, so strictly legally speaking, you have to be nice to me. A lot has also happened over here on this channel in the last couple of months. Enormous thanks to H Bomber Guy and Cat for featuring me in that latest video. My phone was buzzing for days with friends and acquaintances all sending me that same Leonardo DiCaprio pointing gif. Seeing myself in the video mentioned alongside some really phenomenal creators, it had me more thankful than ever that imposter syndrome isn't lethal. Between you and me, I actually covered my eyes like I was watching a scary movie when I had time to watch the video myself and it was coming up to that section. I'm just very easily embarrassed, even if there's nobody else in the room with me. But really seriously, being mentioned like that and featured in a list of queer creators, especially a list of talented creators like that, and then getting a nod from someone that was inspirational to me and putting myself out there and trying to make things that I care about, well, it's hard to put into words. I've actually been sitting here doing takes, trying to improv a way to describe it, and I haven't come up with anything yet. If that's the coolest thing that happens to me while I'm on this website, well, that's a pretty high mark. Uh, we take those. We take those. And I'm also 
incredibly appreciative that I even have a space like this where I can make things that seem fun when it seems fun to do them. And people seem to vibe with that. So from, from the bottom of my gay heart, thank you for even just clicking this video. And if you've seen any of the other ones or anything like that, any, anything, I, I really appreciate it. So going forward, in the past, I've aimed to release a video a month, but in 2024, the year of our Lord and Savior, Luigi Mario 2024, I'd like to prioritize trying to release things when they are done instead of trying to meet deadlines. I think this will give me more time to research and build my skills. Hopefully it will end up making better videos for y'all and also maybe a more fun process for me with more time to be more experimental. Really, this means that there might be a longer period of time between videos, which I hope you'll be okay with. Outside of production and all of that, this also isn't my full-time job. I'm also getting married in spring and in the very particular hell that is wedding planning. I also bought a motorcycle recently and I've been getting into motorcycle touring, so life is getting busy and maybe this will be the start of my motorcycle camping POV YouTuber arc. Now, who knows what the future holds? Anyway, I do have a lot of stuff that I want to work on and I think they're going to turn out pretty well, so please wait warmly and, as always, be nice to yourself. <laughs>